Hello. Uh, welcome to the practitioner stage. Uh, my friend Alan Cooper says that the future is on the hands of the hands-on, so I think we're at the right stage. Um, I really appreciate that you came to the first talk. It's always an honor to kick things off, but it's inevitable to not walk into the building thinking, will someone show up? So I don't take your presence for granted, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for being here. Let's have a great conference. I'm a user experience researcher. I work at YouTube. And I start with my job title because I assume that if you're at a UX conference, you either work in UX or you have an interest in UX. And in our field, there's something very interesting that happens. And it's that when we say our job titles, we get back blank stares. You do what? And if you compare that to someone saying, for example, I'm an ER physician at such and such hospital, or I'm a family law attorney, we get an idea of what those jobs consist of. And we're probably not that off. I'm sure an ER physician and a family law attorney would disagree, but uh, just play with me. And so I've found a solution to this problem, and it's that I no longer say, I am a user experience researcher. I tell people I'm a photographer. And this has solved a problem and created another one. It solved a problem when I talk to people outside of UX because they're like, ah, it involves a camera. I know what you do. But it has created a problem within UX because now it turns heads. And it's like, you do what at YouTube? And so what I want to do today is I want to talk about the journey from going from thinking about myself as a user experience researcher to thinking about myself as a photographer. And to start, I'm going to flip these two words, the I and the am. And so I'm going to start by saying, am I a photographer? And hopefully by the end of today's talk, we'll have an answer to this question. But let's start by thinking conceptually what the job of a UX researcher is. At its most basic level, as researchers, we build the bridge between two contexts that would otherwise not have a good way of talking to each other. On one side, we're part of a product team, and our teams are concerned with coming up with a product strategy and allocating resources, assuming that we all work at places that don't have infinite resources. And on the other side, there's the user context, and they couldn't care less about our product strategy, and they couldn't care less about how we assign our resources <coughs> They care about their needs and their specific behaviors. And as researchers, we build a bridge between these two worlds. And in building that bridge is when the disciplinary ambiguity of our field comes into play. Because each of us is free to build that bridge in whatever way we find relevant. And this is determined by the background that we come from. A lot of us come from field. We didn't study UX research in, in college. We, didn't, we just came here from a different field. And it also depends on the context in which we do work. And so let me explain to you how I build my research bridge at YouTube. I'm going to talk about it how I used to think about it three years ago and how I, talk about, how I think about it today. I've been at Google for about six years. So, I work with YouTube creators, the people who upload content to our platform. Uh, the people, and within that segment, I would say I work with the highest end of that segment, the people who have millions of subscribers, at least a couple hundred thousand. So you could think of them as, as celebrities, but more important than them being celebrities, they're business partners to YouTube. What that means to me as a researcher is that when I'm thinking of picking a method, a lot of the things that we would have done in other types of research don't necessarily work. When I call a YouTube creator and I say, hey, I want you to come meet with me because uh, I work at YouTube, they hear, ooh, I get to meet with the company that I'm a partner with. And so I can't just say, you know, I'm going to do a diary study. It's three weeks long. You need to log this every week. Or I'm going to bring you into a lab where my team is going to be on the other side of a mirror. A lot of times our research looks like this. This is an actual photo of a research session. Uh, what you see there on the left side is John Green. He's a New York Times bestselling author and also a very influential YouTube creator. On the right side, that's me uh, with much shorter hair. Um, and then in the middle, there's the VP of design of YouTube. There's designers. There's other researchers. There's PMs. And there's engineers. 
And so what the way I used to think about my job is that my job was to bring together three actors. The researcher, that's me. The participant, that's a YouTube creator. And my team. And my job was to build the space for them to talk to each other. And that was my research method. And when I was done with that, I would then find, I would go into a cave somewhere and spend a lot of time writing documentation, writing research reports, writing something that would then live in an archive with the idea that our company was building knowledge. And so if you had asked me three years ago, what's your job, I would have said, I build the bridge just like this. However, there was a problem with this, and it was a very personal problem, and maybe some of you might relate. I really loved my research method, but I hated documentation. I hate writing re research reports. I hate putting all this effort into building a beautiful document that then goes into an archive and absolutely no one reads it. And so, although I was happy with the method, I wasn't really happy with how I was documenting my research. And I started looking for ways to make this a more creative effort, something that made me personally, as an individual, happier. And there was something that I would do that I've done for a very long time during the weekends, after work, and it's practicing street photography. And I had the idea that maybe I could bring my photography practice that I thought of as a passion, as a hobby, into my job. And I found this idea of doing visual ethnography, which I'll define very loosely as creating any kind of visual artifact that allows me to tell a story about our users. And I'm doing that specifically with my camera. Dorothea Lange, uh, one of the great American photographers, once said that the camera is an instrument that teaches people how to see without a camera. And I love this quote because it actually puts the emphasis on the right thing. A camera is not about the photos you take with that camera. It's about the mindset you have when you look at the world knowing that you're going to be taking a photo. And to bring this to life, I want to show you a real life example that actually isn't about YouTube. It's about uh, my passion to do street photography. So a few years ago, I went out for a walk. I had a day off. And I did what I always do, which is I grabbed my camera and I started walking with no plan other than I have my camera. And I found myself in front of what was then a random apartment building, and I was in front of it, and I looked up to the second floor, and I saw that there was a man cleaning his windows. And there was something, and I can't really say what it was, but there was something about him that struck me as very energetic and passionate about cleaning those windows. And that made me think, I definitely do not display that passion for cleaning my windows. I hate cleaning my windows. And so for some reason, creepy if you want, I took this picture. And I forgot about it. I continued with my day, kept on living my life. And let's fast forward about eight hours, and I'm finding my way back. And by complete accident, I find myself in front of the same building again. And I remember that in my camera, I have this picture. And so I look up again. And when I look up, the story of what was happening that day kind of jumped at me. I saw this. Aww. So what I like about this, whether the story is real or not, is that I, something that I wouldn't have paid attention to had I not had my camera jumped at me in a way that it wouldn't have if without the medium of photography. And I like this because, by the way, context, I'm originally from Chile, and so there's like a constitutional mandate that you must refer reference another Chilean. So <laughs> Sergio Larraín is the great Chilean photographer, and, uh, and it, his nephew once wrote him a letter and said like, hey uncle, how can I be a better photographer? And he wrote back this beautiful letter that I secretly think was really intended for me to read. Um, and he says, you start to look again. The conventional world puts a veil over your eyes. You need to take it off during your time as a photographer. And that's true. What you need to do is you need to start looking at the world with eyes of capturing stories. And ultimately, that's what we do as researchers. A few years ago, the Smithsonian Institution in the US did a really interesting project. They realized that all of their different institutions had a collection of different images, but that not all of them were put together with an aesthetic purpose, the way that the Museum of Modern Art, for example, would put together a collection of photography. Uh, the historical museum might be using photography as historical artifacts, 
or the science museum might be using photography as a science mechanism. And so they put together a multidisciplinary group of people and they said, we want you to look at all of the Smithsonian's collection of photos. And after a lot of work, they published this book, which is amazing. It's called Photography Changes Everything, and every two pages, someone from a different field writes about the function of photography in their field. And in the introduction to this book, the editors say, perhaps most profoundly of all, we discovered that photographs give us a reason to tell stories. And that's the point of today's talk. Let me tell you a story. This is Anisha. She is known on the internet as Riksha Wali. And uh, she lives in Mumbai. And she has a YouTube channel that is all about empowering female audience members to talk about the things that society has taught them not to talk about. One of the big ones being, for example, menstruation. And Anisha uh, has a very successful YouTube channel. And earlier this year, I went to live with her for a few days. And of course, I brought my camera. And one of the many artifacts that came out of that visit was this collection of images, which reflects a day in the life of Rick Shavali. And at first, it might seem like it's just, you know, a chronological array of pictures. But if you start looking at them more carefully, you're going to see that you can learn a lot about what Anisha's everyday life looks like by looking at these pictures. You might notice, for example, that in this one day, she goes through five different wardrobe changes. And that's because she plays every single character in her videos. You might also notice that despite the fact that on the calendar this day was set aside for video production, running a YouTube channel is a lot like running a small business. And so Anisha, twice during the day, has to stop production and take two business calls that cannot wait to another day because she needs to keep her business running. Also, Mumbai is a city where there's a lot of construction, and so twice during the day we have to stop production because the noise next door from the construction happening next door is so loud that we cannot continue producing a video. And so when this happens the first time, I thought like, wow, we're gonna just have to wait it out. Well, no, you just open the window and yell out, hey, we're trying to do a YouTube video here. Can you please give us five minutes of silence? And both times, the construction workers are like, sure, we'll give you five minutes. We get the scene, we move on, the construction workers come back, construction resumes. And you can also see how long the hours are. Uh, by 4 p.m., Anisha still has four more hours of shooting that day, but she's already feeling really tired. We're all feeling really tired. It's a really long day. And this is day two of production for one eight-minute YouTube video. And if you saw that video, you might not initially realize how much work went into this video. And those photos allow us to understand that effort, allow us to understand Anisha's day-to-day -day job. I don't do this just with Anisha in India. I do this around the world with different creators in different places. And I'm going to show you, quickly just show you flashes of different projects that I've done. This is Megan Tanja. She lives in Los Angeles, California. She uses her YouTube channel to talk about body positivity and encouraging her audience uh, to live a happy life, even if they don't fit society's norms of what a beautiful body looks like. These are Anshul and Manali. They're a couple who lives in Mumbai. They were both uh, software developers at a financial service organization, and they had a passion project on the side. They really liked riddles. And one day they said, hey, we should have a YouTube channel about riddles. And they started doing it on the side. And in October last year, Manali quit the bank and came home full time to run the family business, which is now this YouTube channel. And this photo was taken the day that Anshul went to his bank and quit his job. So it's the first day that this family is working as full-time YouTube creators, and I feel very honored that I got to be there that day. This is Mac Does It. Uh, he is a queer creator from LA, and this is in Florida, in backstage, when uh, he had just been talking about LGBTQ+, youth activism, and uh, there was a fan who really wanted to meet him. She had a pride flag, and when he came off stage, she hugged him, and I was there. This is Jessica Kellgren Fozard. Uh, she is a vintage fashion icon. Um, she lives in Brighton, and you wouldn't 
be able to tell from this photo, but if you saw her channel, uh, she talks about intersectionality and representation because she is both a queer woman and also a person with a disability. And she talks about that and she brings representation not just to YouTube but also to media in general. Rob, do you know Art Attack? Do -do 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 okay, that's, we all know what that is. If you, were, if you grew up in India, you would immediately recognize him as the host of the Indian version of Art Attack. He recently stopped doing his TV show to bring it to YouTube because on YouTube he has the creative freedom he could not get on TV. These are three Latino creators at the Latin Grammys in Las Vegas last year. And we did a series of 22 portraits where at first glance, they look like they're all very visually uniform. But if you read what they wrote, that's their handwriting, you start realizing that we use this word Latino, uh, but that that really captures a very diverse community. And we're almost over. Hannah Witten, she, from this little corner in her apartment in London, uh, has a platform where she talks about sex education and sex positivity. Earlier this year, we had our first Pride Academy in Tokyo, where four openly queer creators talked about LGBTQ plus issues in Japan, a society that is not as open as uh, the US or the UK. And finally, and I could show you hundreds of these examples, but I'm gonna stop here. Uh, this is a creator boot camp uh, that we run around the world. It's called Next Up. This one specifically is in Jakarta, where we invite a handful of up and coming talent to spend a week together and level up their production skills. And uh, this is one of their, uh, those uh, cinematography workshops. So at Google, we have a fundamental premise of how we build our products, and it's focus on the user and all else will follow. And this was written a, lot, a long time before I joined Google and a long time before I started practicing visual ethnography at Google. But I love the photography pun that it's embedded into this phrase. Because I think that I literally focus on the user and all else will follow. This is not just about taking photos and having them live on my computer forever. We then have these photos live in real life spaces where we spend our day to day. This is one of our micro kitchens in Zurich. And if you think about what a micro kitchen is about. A micro kitchen is a space where when you need to disconnect from work because maybe an engineer has been debugging a code base all day, a designer is done with their mocks, they need a break. What we're doing is telling them your opportunity to disconnect from your work, from your tasks, is an opportunity to reconnect with our mission, to reconnect with why we're here in the first place. And so those photos you see at the, at the back of that room, those photos really, um, are a way of telling people you coming today to work to debug, debug whatever you're debugging or to optimize whatever you're optimizing is enabling people like Anisha to succeed and to reach an audience in Mumbai. So why is this relevant? Let me talk about Copernicus for a second. So the Co Copernicus was intrigued by the orbits that planet described in the nighttime because if the Earth was static at the center of the universe, then the orbits that the planets were following were kind of crazy. It was hard to describe, and everything in nature tends to be very simple to describe. And so the Copernican revolution is bringing humility into our understanding of our place in the universe. It's saying, you know what? Maybe we're not the center of the universe. Maybe something else is. And if we do that, then the orbits that the planets describe are much simpler. I think there's a UX lesson in this, because in traditional UX research, when we bring people into a lab, we kind of put our product at the center of our universe, and then we're intrigued by the fact that our users interact with our product in really weird ways. What we need to do is we need to put our users at the center of their own universe, and understand that our products are just one element in their much more rich ecosystem that they exist in. And that's why in many of these photos, there's nothing about YouTube per se. And you can then bring this full circle. Anisha recently visited the Zurich office and I was able to give her a tour and to show her all, that, all the work that we had done together, because I do think of these photos as a collaboration, um, had paid off because now 
her face was all over uh, our office and she wrote, I didn't ask her to post this, when you find out your face is printed on huge posters and hanging in several international Google offices. And she goes on to say something very nice about me. Um, so the key here is that this type of work allows us to build intimacy. And Sarah Days and Terry Williams in their uh, On Ethnography book uh, have this beautiful little text that says, the time spent observing, participating, talking, and listening gradually allows the ethnographer not just to see, but to understand what he sees. And when I read that, this, I felt like it really spoke to me. Because the time I've spent photographing creators is not just about the photos that I've brought home with me. It's about the fact that those photos allow me to really understand what it's like to be a creator and allow me to really tell stories within our company that allow us to build better products for them. So let's bring it back to this. I disliked writing research reports. What photography has allowed me to do is to, instead of think of documentation as something that happens separate from the research, something that happens in a cave, something that happens in a place where no one else can see me and then I put it in a research archive, the method and the documentation are one and the same. And the story kind of writes itself as the research progresses. Of course, there's a little bit of post-production that happens. Those posters don't print themselves and the photos don't kind of like magically edit themselves. But it's much less effort than it would have been if I had been writing uh, a normal research report. So, am I a photographer? And the answer to this question is a little bit disappointing. And it's it doesn't matter. My job at YouTube is not to take photos so that they can coexist with the photographers that inspired me to become a photographer. I'm not at the level of Sergio Larraín. I'm not at the level of Dorothea Lang, but it doesn't matter. My job is very specific. I'm here to tell stories to the product development teams so that they can understand and feel empathy for their users so that in exchange, they can build a better product for them. And in that sense, I'm a successful photographer. So the invitation that I have for you today is don't build the firewall between the things that you do during the weekends, the things that you do late at night after work, and the things that you do at work. Because maybe lurking in those things that you're doing after work or during the weekends, there's the thing that will make the difference between a job that you really like and a job that really fulfills you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Renato. Do we have time for a few questions? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Renato. It was uh, amazing to hear. Do, um, uh, we're going to have a bit of a Q&A with Renato. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask him? Okay. Okay, well, uh, we'll start with this lady over here. Sorry. Did you put your hand up? Yeah. Yes? If we, can, if we can't hear you, I'll run over with the mic. A super good question around, did you all hear? Privacy, how, how do you share those photos? Um, for none of these projects, the day that I'm taking photos is the first day that these creators met me. Obviously, if I'm staying at your place or if I'm living, uh, spending an extended period of time with you, uh, you first need to build that comfort, right? Like, creepy dude with a camera shows up you're not gonna feel comfortable right away. So all of these creators, I do build a relationship with first, and then I sometimes show them the work, and I'm like, this is what I do at YouTube, would you want to participate? Some of them say no, and that's totally fine. Um, so it's not, this is not day one. I didn't meet Anisha that day, we've been friends for a long time, um, and I think that that's actually a good plug to, we're gonna be talking about subjectivity and research in the panel stage downstairs, uh, because there's an element of that in this work. Yes, it is subjective, and it involves uh, me understanding who the user is, them knowing me, knowing my husband, knowing, you know, when they're in New York, they reach out, we go out for a drink, and those things are important for this kind of work to be able to happen. And then we get, of course, there's, I guess our lawyers would want me to say, we also get all the clearances and like... Absolutely. Yes, all of that happens. Compliance is key. Does that answer your question? Yes? Yes? Uh, this gentleman here.
yes, we do bring people. Um, it depends how to structure it. Uh, sometimes the photo work that happens in their studios or at home might be like a very intimate moment, but we usually have like an event the day after or the week after so they can meet them. And also we fly a lot of these creators, as you saw, Anisha was at the Zurich office, she lives in Mumbai. We fly our creators then to come talk about the work that we've done together as a way of like being able to build a better link between what you're seeing on the walls or what you're seeing in these reports and uh, what you're doing specifically. If you're an engineer on YouTube analytics, like there's, that link needs to be done somehow and we do it through talks, we do it by being able to reach out to these creators and, and once they see themselves on the walls, they're like, oh wow, this company really cares about me. I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna spend time telling them my story. Thank you. Any other questions? Sorry in the front. Sorry. Ah, I love this question. Uh, yes, how did you convince YouTube to do this question? Um, I went to the person who was then my boss, and I said, hey, there's this opportunity for me to go take some pictures. And I think that instead of pitching a giant project, instead of saying I'm gonna shift my practice, and I'm not gonna do any more research the traditional way I'm gonna do this, I just did one project. And then one project turned into two, and two projects turned into three, and then someone asked for a project. It's like, ooh, that's validating. Let's go do that project. Uh, so I, my advice for anyone who's thinking about how to come up with new, which I think is what you're going after, right? Like, how do you convince a company? Well, just pilot, right? If I had been, if I had gone on day one with a PowerPoint presentation and said, like, in 2019, this is my job, this is what my job is gonna look like, they would have said, no, you're crazy. And actually, when I pitched the first project, my boss at the time said, I don't understand what you're saying, but why don't you just go out and do it, and if the results are interesting, we might do another one. So just pilot, 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 and then one day, it'll be your reality. Thanks. Any further questions? Anybody? Ah, this gentleman here. Bring your mic over, just that everybody can hear. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Right, okay. So um, you said that you're having quite a close relationship with your uh, users yep. uh, at this point. How does this affect their behavior while you are, you are around, and how does this affect your subjective, if you will, point of view as a researcher? spending so much time with them and building that close relationship? Yeah, I'll start with the second question. I think subjective and truthful are two different things. And so, yes, it's subjective. I hand select them because I have an affinity with them or I feel comfortable. Like, also, I have to feel safe and I have to feel comfortable doing this. Um, so the second question is, yes, it's subjective, but as long as it's truthful, I'm comfortable with it. Uh, and I think my company is. The second question of, like, how does that affect their, their behavior it's difficult, I, they're creators, so they're used to their life being more public than maybe it would be for you and I, right? So I don't think of that as much of a problem in this context as it could be if you were working with someone who doesn't have a media presence like YouTube creators. So I don't think it becomes a problem, but it, it might, I've never thought about it to be honest. I, I, I know them well, I know, like I have a way of vetting the story and also, I guess an answer to that question is, if you're gonna spend three days in a row shadowing someone, no one can be on for that much time. Like, at some point, the real side will come out. Okay, great, we've got time for one, one more question. Anybody wanna take it? No? Okay, thank you so much, Renato. Please thank give you. a very warm thank you to Renato. Thank you so much.